Good morning. <coughs> I know at least since Tuesday you may have noticed a pop. And I don't want you to hold it against me some Palington if that has annoyed you. Oh, I got the cough drop and I'm doing the best I can under the conditions you find me in. Which is exactly what this case is about. I told you an opening statement that this is a family tragedy that the state is trying to find a way to make worse. What condition was Miss Howling in when all this was happening? She told them twice, once at the house, about two minutes and 40 seconds into the discussion there, and again in that interview room, about 10 minutes, and, well, within the first 10 minutes, and she has PTSD. They, have, they know she has PTSD. No one's, gonna, no one's denied that yet. They went through her purse, found all the meds. What's this for? It's all PTSD medicine. We talked about this at Lord Iron, and some of you have had personal experience with family members and friends. We talked about how it makes you, makes you want to isolate and be quiet. And so what do they say about that? Well, she was quiet. She didn't seem quite as, as upset as we thought she should. That's what PTS medicine does. It keeps you from being excited. But they said, that's suspicious. Yeah, it's got to be suspicious because we don't recognize accidents. The hammer has left the room. Got to be a motive. Not if it's an accident. <clears throat> well, I guess not if it's an accident. Then in that interview, <coughs> she, again, she's not quite as emotional as they think she should be. She says, I'm a little scared. Wardlaw says, Your child is dead and you don't want to talk to us. You don't care. She says, not that I don't care, I told you I was raped by a police officer. And in this rapport building exercise that Mr. Riddle was conducting, she got this response. tell you that she lied over and over. She lied, she lied, she lied. It's made up these stories. You know exactly what she told them and when she told for the first time another person that Gavin killed Destiny. And it's 15 minutes, 10 minutes maybe after the shooting that she is texting Joey I need you to come pick up that gun I put it beside the house Gavin killed Destiny. So this whole thing comes down to she just put all those elements up there on the board. Did she knowingly place the gun in a place where Gavin could get a hold of her? Well, 
Ladies and gentlemen, you will look to the court for the law. I will instruct you on the law as soon as all the argument is concluded. If there is a discrepancy between what the lawyers are telling you the law is and what the court instructs you the law is, the court is who you look to for the law. Go ahead with your argument. So, the whole incident they show you on the neighbor's video, from the time she gets home with the kids from about 8.42 till the 911 calls made at 8.53. We're talking about 11 minutes of this woman's life in the most horrible moments of her life. In this 11 minute span, she did not plan to come home from the park and fix dinner and have her son shoot her daughter. This was not a planned event, so she hadn't thought ahead about how this was gonna work. But like we talked about in Bore Dyer, people with PTSD get triggered. Well, she got triggered. A gun is fired in the house. Her daughter has been shot. She's not allowed to go to the hospital. She's taken in a police car. They play that little snippet for you to say, she's calling Joey and saying, hey, go, can you do what I asked you to do? Can you do what I texted you? They didn't play the part where she says, oh my God, I hope my baby's okay. God, please let my baby be okay. Please let my baby be okay. Have, officer, have you heard anything about the condition of my baby? They didn't play that part. They didn't stop that when they were doing it with the officer say, hey, did you hear that? No, because it doesn't fit their cold calculating story. And was there any evidence that Robin Howington is a negligent mother? Did you hear from DCS to come in here and tell you, oh, God, we've had all these problems. Oh, it's, it's horrible. These yeah, poor children. In fact, what did the medical examiner's report show? A normally developed, well-nourished child. And let's, let's be honest. You heard a lot of questioning that we're talking about. Would you, would you leave a child who had been injured? Would you leave a child who had been injured? Would you leave a child who had been injured? I shouldn't have to speak these words in front of the child. I, I apologize. This is a tragedy. The medical examiner told you Destiny couldn't live with that injury for approximately 15 to 30 seconds. That's the reserve oxygen. At that point, her heart's not beating, it's not taking oxygen from the lungs to the brain. Within 15 to 30 seconds, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, she was dead. You've heard the facts. I suggest to you that in the time it took her to see that flash and figure out where the gun was, where Gavin was, where Destiny was, that Destiny was not moving and not responding, Destiny was gone. The 911 call is three minutes long. The officers don't arrive for another couple of minutes. God love Officer Cummings. He's the only he's the only individual in this government process who can answer Riddle's question, don't you have a heart, don't you have a soul? And he can say yes. Because he's got a heart as big as all outdoors. He picks that child up, he carries her outside. He knows she's dead. He's been trained EMT. She, I talked to him about that. She's got no heartbeat. She's got no breathing. You got no heartbeat. You got no breathing. You are dead. The best he could say, he didn't even want to say it on that stand. Through tears, he didn't want to say it. He said, 
clinical issues. Clinically, she'd been dead for a few minutes before he got there. That's just that's just the unfortunate truth. She shouldn't have to relive this because she shouldn't be on trial for an accident. They're, they just got up here and told you. We're not saying she wanted the child dead. She, we're not saying she killed the child herself. We're just holding her responsible for the fact that the child got a hold of a gun. And what were the circumstances leading up to the child getting a hold of the gun? First off, two days before, you've been told, and Ms. Howington told them, and they corroborated by speaking to Mr. Oliver, Mr. Oliver Howard. Good to see you again. Uh, and to Callie. And when they spoke with Mr. Oliver and spoke with Callie, they, they corroborated the story of what happened on the 12th. Some differences in whether or not who the instigator was. He's at her house, he's angry at Callie. Angry at Callie's there. She asked him to leave, he won't leave. It's the same man who lost her, her 17, 16 year old child at the time because she put her in the hospital and the father ran in and got emergency relief and got custody of her child while she was out of consciousness in the hospital due to a beating administered by Mr. Oliver. She told them that. And the state's going to tell you, now, they didn't force her to say anything about Antoine Oliver. They didn't make her say that. I'm going to tell you, as far as I'm concerned, 10 minutes and 30 seconds into that interview, that interview ended. You can't take a woman who's got PTSD who just watched her child be killed in, in her house in front of her by her other child, jump up and down, yell and scream and cuss at her and tell her she's got no heart, she's got no soul, and then say, let's continue. You think that might have triggered her? Like she needed any more triggering? You think they, she needed, did Robin Howington need for either Mr. Wardlaw or Mr. Riddle to tell her, your daughter's dead. She was well aware of that fact. And I will give Mr. Riddle credit. When he took that stand and I asked him, now, if it was an officer involved shooting, the officer would be given time to review his records, his reports, maybe video. He kind of hemmed and hawed with me for a minute, but he said, okay, okay. Yeah, policy on and off has been 48 to 72 hours to reconcile the facts. This is a trained police officer. A trained law enforcement officer would get 48 hours to 72 hours. He didn't mention anything about it immediate short media brief statement like Mr. Wardlaw did. He said 48 to 72 hours to reconcile the facts in their head. This woman who is suffering from PTSD, who has been at Chuck E. Cheese and then out to the friend's house and then to the park and then comes home to feed her children and then suffers the worst tragedy she has ever suffered, that her son gets hold of the gun and shoots her daughter. She gets questioned immediately at the house. They don't let her go to the hospital where her daughter is. <coughs> they take her to the hospital an hour after the shooting, about 10.06, the doctor declares her daughter dead, comes into the room and tells her that. 
40 so or so minutes later, she's in an interview room at KBD. Not 48 hours, 40 minutes later. State just loves those clips, gonna show you those clips. They can play all the videos that exist in the world and that's not gonna convert this from a family tragedy to a murder. It's not. But one thing that is interesting is that when you look, if you look at those clips at any other time, notice the time on them. 12, 12.45, 1.45, they're back at her house with her at three or four o'clock in the morning. She has been with them for a work day on the worst night of her life. And they want to say, well, then she said this, it wasn't true, and this, it wasn't true. So see, that means she's guilty. Not that she's confused. In fact, not that Miss McDermott stood up there and said, let me show you this other video that happened the next day. It was two days later. Did she lie to you? No, she was confused. Can you imagine if she was confused in a courtroom where she works, in a job that is her profession, to deal with questions and answers and facts. Ms. Howington was being interviewed on the worst day of her life about the worst possible circumstances. And she needs to get everything right. And if we talk about why those officers might need 48 or 72 hours, think about some of the things Ms. Howington told them. They talked about in that 17th story that she was telling them that on the night of the killing, that Antoine gets the gun and he takes the thing out of it. He's trying to take the thing out of it. That's what she told him happened on the 12th. And what they verified happened on the 12th. He, got, he took the gun away from her. She pulls the gun. He takes the gun away. She pulls the gun and says, leave. He won't leave. He snatches the gun from her. She doesn't shoot him. She didn't even have a finger on the trigger because if it did, when he snatched the gun, it would have fired. She's got the gun in her hand trying to make him leave. He won't do it. He takes it, breaks it apart, throws it down, and Callie went and got it. So Oliver said that, and Callie said that. And the officer testified, Mr. Riddle did, that he questioned them, and yes, that's what they said about what happened on the 12th. So Callie's the last person with a gun. She says, she tells you, I told him, put it away. Now, she's just been in this confrontation with Mr. Oliver. He's taken the gun away from her and thrown it. Uh, Callie's gone to pick it up. Do you really think she wants to deal with the gun again? She says, put it away. This is two days before the shooting. The state would have you ask, ma'am, why didn't you go in there the next day and check and see where that gun was? <coughs> so for two whole days, you hadn't looked to see where your gun is? How often do you go look and see where your gun is? She tells him it's in the closet on the shelf because that's where I keep it. She tells him Gavin had to climb up there on the stool because Gavin got the gun. And remember, that's what we're charged with, that Gavin got the gun. And that Ms. Howington allowed that to happen, and that's negligence, and it resulted in so they're giving you that Gavin got the gun. She's in this room in her mental state that she possesses at that moment. As one of you described, how could a mother be in her right mind under those circumstances? She is under those circumstances, and she's trying to figure out how the hell did Gavin get the gun? Well, he must have got on the stool. He must have got to the closet, because that's where the gun is, because that's where she keeps it. The truth of the matter, as she told you yesterday was, after Callie, she asked him to put it away. She had never told Callie where she kept the gun. He didn't know where she kept the gun. He went and put it away, wherever away is at that point. So when they ask her where was the gun, she tells them where she keeps it. In reality, she's not thinking that Callie Moop had it two days ago, and I don't know where, where he put it. I just assume it's where I keep it. Not the right assumption, but under the circumstances, understandable, if you want to understand it, 
if you believe accidents are possible, or if you don't, and you just think that everything should be a murder, it's got to be a murder, and it's got to be a motive, then sure, <coughs> prosecute this Howard to for that. <clears throat> but that's not the facts of this case. They didn't tell her, they didn't make her put, uh, throw Antoine under the bus, as, as she said. By God, they did. There's Mr. Wardlaw right there. What did he say to her? I'm going to shoot you straight. I think it was bad. Okay. I think he was upset that you were with Cali, the whole situation, and he came in and he shot her. And the hammer spoke up. He says, I think so too. He hit the nail right on the head. You can't ask for a better sentence than he hit the nail right on the head. Because he's the hammer. He doesn't believe that every homicide is not a murder. It's got to be a murder. And he's running around hitting the microphone because that's a nail. Hit the lights, those are nails. To a hammer, everything's a nail. And that explains his discussion with Ms. Howington. No, you're not a grieving mother. No, you're not a rape victim. No, you're not a, a sufferer of PTSD. You're a liar. Fibbers are always fibbers. But well, what did these two gentlemen tell her? She's explaining to them how Kevin could have got this gun and how he shot his sister. Ma'am, that's not possible. That child couldn't pull the trigger. That's not true, it didn't happen, it's not possible. Now, put, think about this for a minute. Ms. Howington knows what happened. She knows Gavin pulled the trigger. And she's got two professional investigators telling her, not physically possible, it didn't happen. That's gonna be hard for anybody to say, I know what I know, why are you telling me that's not possible? Well, compound that with a person who has PTSD, is medicated for PTSD, and has just been yelled, screamed at by an insane police officer who's telling her she has no soul and no heart. Were they lying? Because the TBI expert said, yeah, there's a, there's a study that was done, and three and four-year-olds, 25% of them, can pull the trigger on a gun with 10 pounds of trigger pull. Now, I know I'm in big trouble because Gavin's not three. That's the youngest study they did, three and four-year-olds. Gavin is not three. Gavin is two and a half. And this is a five-pound trigger pull. He said, as to this gun, in this case, it is possible for him to have pulled that trigger. So, they lied to her. Well, wait a minute, Mr. Brown, well, that's not fair. Maybe they didn't know it at the time. Maybe that's really the strongly held belief. How come she doesn't get that same break? How come she can't be confused? How come she has to get all of it correct the first time around? 40 minutes after being told her child is dead. And then for four hours into the night, into the wee hours of the morning, she's got to have it right. They wouldn't even have talked to the cops at that point. If it had been a police officer shooting, they wouldn't even have talked to him yet. We're still within 12 hours. He said, what about the first 48 hours? It's really not very important. first 48 minutes. It's not when it's a cop involved shooting. And then, Ms. McDermott stood right here at this lake and asked, Mr. Riddle, Mr. Riddle, isn't it true that police involved shootings are different? Yes, it is. And then she stopped. And I got up and asked her, how? How are police involved shootings any different than any other shooting? Well, Mr. Riddle is a human being, a police officer or a citizen, using a gun, pulling the trigger, 
and someone getting injured and killed. Well, yeah. <coughs> so, it's not different at all, is it? Well, I guess not. Now, one has to ask, why would you ask that question? And why did he say yes, knowing they weren't different? That's called perjury if you do it on the actionary. When you raise your hand and say you'll tell the truth, and then just in a knee-jerk reaction to a bad question, uh, well, aren't they different? Yes, ma'am. That's perjury. Why would he do that? He knew better. He absolutely knew better. So let me tell you why I think he did it. Because this, this, and this, and that, well, a couple of those got two sides. This box and all these photographs and all these discs, there is no proof that Miss Howington knew where that gun was because Callie had put it away. And so there's no proof that she knowingly made that gun available to the child and as a negligent act. So, blow smoke. What's the biggest smoke? Let's talk for a moment about those 63 seconds. How many times Ward Law and Riddle tell her, we ain't the dope police lady. We don't care about that. They were at her house within two minutes of the 911 call. They were there for another, that's nine o'clock in the middle of the I'll give them a few minutes. Let's say nine o'clock at night, the police arrived, so they were there a few minutes earlier. They were there until four o'clock in the morning at least. Did anybody show you any evidence that they found Roxy's in her house? She had a purse full of prescription bottles. Did anybody? show you any Roxy's that were in her purse? Did anybody say she had baggies or packaging or Roxy's in the house somewhere? So why are we talking about that? Because in that and that and that and all that up there, they don't have the evidence they need. So they just want to throw things at the wall and say, that's a bad woman convicted. She was doing a drug deal. With Mr. Key. Mr. Key, he's an interesting fellow too. He testified on Friday at a hearing that said, I said, they said, how'd you know Miss Howard? Oh, I met her through friends in the neighborhood. Who, what kind of friends? Oh, I did work for people in the neighborhood. They referred her to me. Uh, she was willing to pay me a decent wage, so I, I, I did. Ladies and gentlemen, you will judge which facts are before you and which are not. If they are facts not in evidence, you may not consider them. Go ahead. And I, I knew her for, I was doing odd jobs for her. And then I got some, I got some pills from her because my grandma was dying. And I got some pills from her. That was on Friday. On Tuesday, we testified. Sir, how do you know what's happening? I bought pills from her. And I asked him on the cross. I said, wait a minute, you remember Friday? You said you knew her because you did odd jobs for her, you painted her house, you cut her lawn. You took your child over to her house and her, her children and your child played on the trampoline while you were doing the work. And now all of a sudden, she's a pill dealer. Huh. Her house from Friday to Monday, he got a new perspective on her. Maybe because they don't have the evidence they need, so throw some at her. She told you why she put that gun outside. I'm, I'm still baffled today by Riddle's response to her in the room. Ma'am, I know your daughter's dead, but you have many more children. You need to be thinking about that. She has two children, one's an adult, and the other is Gabby. That's it. Destiny is gone. Gavin is the only one who's left. Gavin, as they are telling you here today, and throughout this trial, shot his sister, mortally wounding her by accident. 
this is a woman who has her own mental health struggles because of trauma she has suffered. And she's thinking about that boy and what's going to happen to him. He's going to spend the rest of her his life knowing that he's the one who killed his sister. She does not want that. So she tells him it was some unknown man. Now, did the police start a, a dragnet for some unknown man? No. They couldn't. She puts the gun outside, and she says for two reasons. One is because she wants it out of the house. It's just been fired in the house, and it's resulted in the death of her daughter. Her son is still in the house. She puts the gun outside. But she put it outside because she's also worried the police are going to blame her for some kind of for possessing the weapon. She doesn't have a felony, they told her. You don't have a felony, you can possess the weapon. They say, we're not going to, we wouldn't have gone after Gavin, what do you think? We arrest a two-year-old? Well, I'd say if you're in an interview room with a woman who tells you multiple times that she has PTSD as a result of rape, and her daughter has just been killed, and you jump up and down and yell and scream and pound the table and cuss her and tell her she ain't got a heart and a soul, I don't know exactly what's on your list of things you want to do. It's pretty short, I'm assuming. And I am absolutely shocked. And I hope they don't get up here again, because I'm not going to get a chance to talk to you again. They go, they can't figure out whether you remember best what you heard the first time. Get both to the state. So they're going to get able to get back up after I sit down and talk and, and rebut what I told you. I don't get to do that again. I just ask you to think in the back of your mind what Mr. Raymond said about that. Because it's very simple, I believe, ladies and gentlemen. This was not a planned act, it happened. You don't believe that Ms. Howington was traumatized by the fact that her two and a half year old son shot her five year old daughter. I can tell you that within two hours of the shooting, she's sitting in a KBD interview. Part of the time she's at the house, part of the time she's being transported to the hospital, part of the time she's sitting there. If that's not the most traumatic event you can you can imagine, no, I can't picture anything else. But that's the person they were talking to. Did they treat her at all like a victim in any way? No. In fact, yesterday they questioned whether or not she had been raped. Isn't it true, ma'am, that he was actually only charged with? making false reports to the TBI. Two female prosecutors. Just finish up your argument. No. Can you no. talk about the parties to the lawsuit, not the lawyers, Mr. Biden? Minimizing the violence perpetrated upon Ms. Howington by the individual named by the sheriff of Sullivan County to oversee this program. And then to suggest that because someone else made decisions in Sullivan County, and cut some kind of deal, that she must be lying to you about having been raped. Most rape victims don't want to talk about being raped. Certainly not in, in a room with two other police officers who are yelling and screaming at them. Or coming into a courtroom and say it, talk about it. Don't be mistaken. That's what started the PTSD. That's why she was being treated. That's why she had medications for PTSD. No matter what anyone else says. And if I'm not mistaken, said in closing argument a minute ago was after Mr. Wardlaw threw Mr. Oliver on the bus, 
she said, Ms. McGrum said, all Ms. Howington had to do was say no. Short memory. PTSD will do that to you, too. I asked Mr. Borlaug, remember what she said after you asked her, so is it possible that Anton would have killed her? Well, show it to me. Play the video. Let me see it. Here's the transcript. You said, is it possible that Antoine would do it? What was her response? No, I promise you he didn't do it. It wasn't him. She said no. They wouldn't accept no. But once she got around to saying, okay, you're right. You're right, Ms. Wardlaw. I can't do this anymore. You're right. What happens then? She's now the queen of the ball. They're going to try to get her in a hotel, get Gavin there for protection. <coughs> They're going to look out for her and make sure she's safe. That's what you do with investigative techniques. You're training people to give you the answers you want. They got the wrong answer. Now they want to blame it on her. She said, I can't take it. I can't do it anymore. You're right. And the abuse stops. There's a pretty good thing to look forward to. I tell you what you want us, what you say is true. You stop screaming at me. Triggering that PST, PSTD, making me think I'm crazy. Because you're telling me everything I know isn't true. That's a hell of a place to be. So she told him, somebody else did it. She told you she said that to protect him. And the other steps that she took after that, telling him, agreeing with them, oh, it was Mr. Yeah, you're right, Mr. Oliver did it. And it gets up, still gets it all gap. You're being told, oh, she's trying to self-preservation. She's not charged with having shot the child. Gavin is the one who shot the child. Does it not make sense that she would try to protect Gavin, the only child, despite Mr. Riddle's math, that she has left? That she doesn't want to have to suffer mental illness for the rest of his life because he shot his sister? Is that not a reasonable goal for a mama bear to take? Everything after that just builds on that. How are you going to, other than that is to say, Gavin did. They start saying, that's not true, this is not true. And finally, she gets to it and says, yeah, it is. And when you look, well, you don't have a mannequin anymore. Lay a mannequin on its side. That's when you shop just off the top of that couch, <coughs> off the cushions of the couch, the seating of the couch, at about a two foot height from the floor. Not where Gavin would be if he was pointing a gun. They kept telling her, that's not true. He would have to be on top of her, shooting like this, down into her. That, that thing should have gone through the couch and into the floor. <clears throat> so it was a couch cushion right behind her when she was lying on her side. They had all the evidence they needed to know that this was an accident and that she was not responsible for it. But because they couldn't give her what they would give each other, which is 48 to 72 hours, to figure out what's going on, and we hope they are not suffering from PTSD and medicated like she was. They had given her that 48 to 72 hours. They would have had time to know what happened. They would have had time to collect collected all that evidence at the scene and found the bullet in the cushion and stopped telling her lies about where it should be and why it didn't there, and that must mean you did it. Because it's not adding up. It's not adding up because you don't know what the numbers are. You haven't done the investigation. You just drug this woman into a room and screamed at her for four hours and tell her all the things that you want it to be. It's clearly domestic. We knew that all along. We knew that. Thank you for telling us that's what we needed you to do. Now we're going to help you. She didn't change her story. They changed. She 
testified yesterday and she told you. And she told Wardlaw. They kept telling me I could, he couldn't have got on the steps. He couldn't have got on the stool. He couldn't have got, couldn't have got on top of that closet. It couldn't happen. It's not physically possible. You're lying. What did she answer to Wardlaw? He either climbed up on, on the stool or the gun wasn't where I put it. He either climbed up there or the gun wasn't where I put it. <clears throat> I suggest to you four days of testimony is that this was a horrible family tragedy and that's where it should have stayed they're not claiming that she killed this child <coughs> but they charged her with murder because maybe Gavin got his hand on the gun because it was placed in the wrong place by somebody else. Elevates this to a felony murder. Only the state could try to find a way to make a family tragedy worse. Don't join them. They have failed to prove that this is anything other than that. In four days of testimony, all the evidence, and all the questions about whether or not truthful statements were made doesn't change what happened. Ten minutes to nine on September 14th, 2019. It doesn't change what happened at that moment. It's just a justification to make it more and more the the possibility of an accident. Even though now they're telling you that nobody's telling you Gavin intended to shoot. It's not the best to me either. It was just a horrible accident. Let it stay there. Please return a verdict and not guilty. Thank you. All right, thank you.